start a service. Praise God. Welcome back, even though you've been coming all summer. It just seems like when we change the times back in, this, in the fall uh, to include Sunday school, it's like a, a, a fresh start. And so if you were not in Sunday school this morning, we do have a class for all ages beginning at 930. We only have two options for adults, by the way. And uh, one is the class on Thessalonians, which meets in the library, and the other one is a class on your spiritual gift. And so this morning, I'm going to walk around and ask each of you, what is your spiritual gift? <laughs> ah, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But that gives you the fear you just felt. It's like, I should go to that class, because if he does ask me, I want to be able to answer him. A spiritual gift, by the way, just in a nutshell, is not a talent that you've been born with or, or one that you've been educated in. A spiritual gift is a gift given by the Holy Spirit that you would not be able to accomplish apart from a supernatural dwelling of the Holy Spirit. So if you do some things well, that might not be a spiritual gift. That just might be the way that you've been created or taught. And so God's given every believer a spiritual gift or gifts to be used for his glory to build up the body of believers and to reach people for Christ. If you're not sure what your gift is, you really should be going to that class. Um, and if you are sure what it is, and you want to have a little bit more understanding and talk about those things, I'd encourage you to go to that class. If you're not in that class, we hope you're in the other class, because we really, truly want to take every opportunity we can to grow in our faith for the Lord Jesus Christ. We do have classes for the children as well, and uh, sorry uh, to the Thessalonians class today. I left the room for a second with the teens forgot what that does to a room when you don't have a leader in there and it got kind of loud so I'm sorry about that but we're okay I had to fill in for Luke because he has that drill so next week that won't happen all right so that's our that's my promotion on on uh, Sunday school we do have Sunday school we also have clubs starting at five o'clock we have a meal for everybody even if you're not involved in clubs you don't want to cook a meal that night come just let us know you're coming right Merla so we have the right number okay and, uh, and, of course, if you want to see what clubs is about, you're welcome to stay and kind of watch and see what's going on. And we could always use helpers in the event that uh, you want to say, how can I help? But please come to the meal at 5, and then everything begins at 5.30, and it ends at 7. Look in your bulletin. There's other announcements there about choir starting. That starts at 7 o'clock after clubs and prayer time is over. And uh, there's a lot of stuff, actually, in your bulletin, and I'm just going to have you read it, okay? I just want to highlight that uh, we have one more picture day. Some of you will already have your pictures from this directory that we're putting together. Uh, we have one more picture day, and that's on Monday, September 8th. We would love to have you in there. Again, I want to apologize. If you came to have your picture taken and you got had to wait because they got backlogged, uh, we are sorry for the wait, and I hope that you'll still come and get your picture in the directory and talk to Darcy or contact the information there uh, to share when you would like to have your picture taken. And then next week is what I'm going to go, I'm going to go on a limb here and say it's the last outdoor baptism we're going to have for a while. <laughs> and that's going to take place at Cary Lake after the morning worship service. We're going to invite you to come out to the, come out to the lake at about 1230, I'll say, just based upon the fact that some of our people have to get changed. But at 1230, we'll have a, a baptism service at Cary Lake. It will not be very long, um, especially once we get in the water. And so uh, we just want you to come. But I can tell you this much right now. I can guarantee you that that water is not as cold as sometimes when we've been in here. I guarantee you. So uh, come in and, and celebrate together the baptism of the young and the older that are coming uh, specifically for that next week. And I appreciate it. And if you are one that would like to be baptized since your conversion, you haven't done that, and you feel this is what God you know, intends, and it is, then let me know. We can still make that, that, those arrangements. Other announcements are in your bulletin, as I mentioned. Ushers, would you come forward, please, as we prepare to receive the Lord's tithes and offerings. As they come forward, I want to just give you a quote from Charles Swindoll. Choose to view life through God's eyes. This will not be easy because it doesn't come naturally to us. We cannot do this on our own. We have to allow God to elevate our vantage point. Start by reading his word, the Bible, pray, and ask God to reform your thinking. Let him do what you cannot. Ask him to give you an eternal, divine perspective. Amen. So let's go to prayer together as we ask God those things. 
Heavenly Father, I do thank you so much that we can be here. It's so good to see these folks here. And God, we know that across our country, there are many churches like this that are meeting together to grow in their faith, to hear from you, and to fellowship with other believers. I pray, Heavenly Father, for our sphere of influence, our location here in Hibbing, that we will have a dynamic impact for the glory of Jesus Christ, and that we will reach people with the message of salvation, and we will see the numbers in this congregation grow because we're effective in sharing our faith. I pray for the opportunities that we just talked about to grow in our faith, about spiritual gifts, about the books of the Bible, the women's Bible studies. Lord, I know I have some men asking, can we have a Bible study? I, I pray, God, that we will be able to effectively, within the realm of what you've called us to do and to be, design, Lord Jesus, opportunities to reach people for Christ and enable them to become fully committed to your purposes. Lord, we do pray for those that are going through hardships in their life. Our bulletin each week is filled, Lord Jesus, with people that are struggling. Some, Lord Jesus, have lost loved ones in the last year or two. I pray, Heavenly Father, that as they approach and as they reach those anniversary dates, the dates of the death and the dates of Father's Day or Mother's Day or the dates, Heavenly Father, of Christmas, Thanksgiving, these things, when all of a sudden their loved one isn't there anymore. God, that you will put in them your holy peace and presence. Allow them to know that they can still grieve, but to know, God, you're with them. Father, I pray that you will be with those that are going through health issues, and God, we have so many that are struggling, Father, with trying to get past pneumonia, or trying to get past cancer, or trying to get past diabetes, or trying to get it past some other affliction. And as we look this morning, today is Communion Sunday, we talk about divine healing. God, you are the God that heals, and so I pray the power of Jesus Christ upon these people, that you will mend that which is broken, correct that which is wrong, and that God, that sin will not prevail in the curse of sickness, but Lord, that you will be raised up through the body of your, your children. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you will help us as followers of Christ to never see coming to church or never see reading your Bible or never see prayer or never see our relationship with you as a safety net, but as the primary purpose of our existence, and that we would hunger and thirst after righteousness for your namesake, knowing that we will be blessed now as we continue to worship you in music and the giving of our finances, the giving of ourselves. Lord, even now begin to work in us as we go through this process of corporate worship, that we would take time during the singing or time during the service or uh, the message, that, that we would examine ourselves before you so that when we get to the communion table, that we can receive and rejoice knowing, God, that we have appro approached you with appropriate, appropriate manner. Prepare those that are sick, Lord, and speak into their lives, and if you want them to come forward for prayer, for healing, God, I pray they do not hesitate, but they come forward. Be glorified today, I pray, as we worship you. Speak into our lives about who you are, truly. Expand our horizons, like you read of what Charles Swinton Dahl said, that you would open our eyes and understanding to who you are much greater than we could possibly understand our own. I pray these things in your marvelous name. Amen. Immortal, invisible God, only wise, enlightened, accessible, hid from our Thy great name we pray. 
Righteousness like mountains high soaring above, thy clouds which are fountains of goodness and love. Great Father of glory, pure Father of light, thine angels adore thee, all veiling their sight, all praise we would render, O only the splendor of light hideth thee. Amen. Amen. Before we sing the next song, and I apologize for this interruption, but I know that Gloria Bush had asked me to make an announcement, completely forgot about it. I don't remember what it was for. So could you shout it out for me, please? That's it. Thank you. Operation Christmas Child. We start that at the end of the month, but right now you can get great deals in school supplies and such. So if you want to participate in that, now would be a good time to start shopping. Thank you for that. I'm sorry I forgot. Let's talk about our awesome God now, shall we? <laughs> Awesome. 
Father God, you are the great I am. God, you are so worthy, so glorious, so holy. We attempt to continue to unveil who you are. Lord, let your spirit open our minds to truth and understanding. That we might stand in awe and understand, Lord, apart from you, we really are nothing. Praise be your holy name. Amen. You may be seated. As we continue in our series, Who is God? It's a tough question to answer. We were introduced to the fact that without God, there is no us, for he is the creator. Without God, there is no hope. Without God, there is no love, for God is love. There is no salvation. There is no peace. There is no justice. We have countered some notions of God with biblical truth about the evidence of God that dwells within us, the uniqueness of God as creator and savior. We have looked at names of God as seen in the great I Am from both the Old and New Testament. Today we look at the brief list of the nature of God, or as referred to his attributes, all expressed through him who is love. We are not giving an exhaustive list, by the way, of his attributes or his nature. As we begin, I'm going to start with God is omniscient, because last week I put in the, your sermon notes that God is omniscient, and then I talked about his omnipotence, or his omnipresence, maybe it was. And so I'm going to clarify those for you. I'm sorry I gave you the wrong terminology last week. In Psalm 139, we read this, beginning with verse 1. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thoughts from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there was a word on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. This is omniscient or omniscience. The word omni means everywhere or all. The word science is knowledge. And so this terminology means God is all-knowing. God is knowledge, God's knowledge encompasses every possible thing that exists, has ever existed, or will ever exist. Nothing, listen really close, nothing is a mystery to God. Nothing. Now, I don't want to shake you up, but, but I do want to bring us all to reality, okay? When I was younger, I would go to my mom um, and I asked her a question. I remember specifically asking this question. How do you know that if you're going to do something wrong, that it's a sin, that it's wrong? How do you know that wrong's wrong? And we've all been there at some point where you wonder that, well, if I think this way or if I act this way, is that wrong? Really, is, that, is God opposed to that? And my mom came up with a really good answer. If you think it's wrong, it's wrong. If you think, you have to stop and question about doing it, don't do it. If you have to evaluate, should I or shouldn't I, then you shouldn't. Because that's the Holy Spirit speaking into your, your mind. Don't offend God and don't um, stand apart from his holiness. In God is omniscient, we read that God knows everything. So I just want to remind us all of that. God knows everything. He knows when you're all alone with your friends, 
and what you're doing. Matter of fact, we read here, it says, before there was a word on my tongue, God knows what you're going to say. God sees us in the privacy of our closet, if you will. If you're home all alone and you're in front of that computer screen, he knows what you're looking at, whether it be something that's okay or something that's not. He understands your conversations at work and with your friends, whether you're gossiping or you're not. And you know what? He even knows where you're going with that. God knows it all. Now, God, in his holiness, is saying, I trust you, because the Bible says we are not given beyond that which we can endure. God, that's God's way of saying, I trust you. If you're in that situation, I trust that with my Holy Spirit, you will make the right choice and not sin against me. But it is our choice, and God knows what we're doing. So young people and old people and everything in between, God knows. He knows what you're thinking right now. Isn't that terrible? I mean, it's good, but... But because if, if, if we've been involved in an offense of God, and all of a sudden, it, it right now, it's like coming to mind because the Holy Spirit said, hey, you're going to have communion soon. You need to know about this? It's like, oh, I didn't know you knew about that. Well, I did know you, but I think I convinced myself you didn't know about that. God knows everything. And he's knowledgeable about all of our thoughts before we even speak them. Not only does he know everything, but God is omnipresent, which means he is everywhere, on the all, present meaning all at the same time. God is all present. God is everywhere at the same time. See, as a kid, when I wanted to do something bad, I would sneak away from my parents because I knew if they saw me doing bad things, I'd be in trouble. I cannot and you cannot sneak away from God. We might like to think that, or we might like to rationalize it and go, well, God's love and God's forgiving, so I'm going to do this. And I'll just come back and say, God, please forgive me. Ha, 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 no, it don't work that way. God does forgive, but God holds us accountable for the intent of our heart. God is everywhere, in, around, everything, close to everyone. In Psalm 139, beginning with verse 7, we just read the first six verses. The psalmist writes, where can I go from your spirit? By the way, the answer to that is nowhere. That's the quick version. I'll read the rest. Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand will lay hold of me. Now understand that verse, before we go any further, your right hand will lead me, your right hand will lay hold of me, is a blessing, now this is, it's a really rough translation here, but it's a blessing curse kind of verse. Because the blessing is, God, if I'm all alone, if I feel like everybody else is against me, if I feel like I am just isolated from everything, God, you're still there. I could be out drowning in an ocean, God, you're there. That's the blessing. The cursed part, if you will, is, and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I'm out there hiding and I'm trying to do something I shouldn't be doing, if I'm engaging in a thing that is offense to God, is a sin against God, God, you are there. And you will lay hold of me. And I will break your heart every time I sin against you. Verse 11, if I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will, me will be night, Here's a person that's going through into depression, possibly, if you could read it that way. I am having these things going on in my life. I'm sick, and I don't know how to control it, or I'm, I've had death in my family, or, or everybody's against me. I made a wrong decision at work, and I'm losing my job. I'm losing my house, and I'm feeling everything is encompassing me. God, I'm living in this darkness. Even the darkness is not dark to you. And the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. God you are there. I remember when Craig Smith, remember he's a Native American pastor, credentialed with the Alliance. He was here, he was, came up in a wheelchair. Remember that? 
wrote the book called 313, Mile Marker 313, because they were traveling from council to go do some ministry, and they rolled in this van that they were in, and he's had now 22 operations since those four years. He still is in a wheelchair primarily, although he can move around a little bit with his crutches. And someone asked him the question, where was God when you were rolling through that, bouncing around inside that van? God was in there bouncing around with him. God is everywhere. Not only is God omniscient, all-knowing, omnipresent, everywhere present, but God is omnipotent. Jeremiah 32, verse 17. Ah, Lord God. I should have picked this song, but I didn't. Um, Behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you, who shows loving kindness to thousands, but repays the iniquity of fathers into the bosom of their children after them. O oh, great and mighty God, the Lord of hosts is his name. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? In other words, I'm the creator. I made it all. Can't I... Take care of it the way I should. Fix it if it's broken. Save it if it's lost. You see, om omnipotence means all, or omni, powerful. God is all powerful. He spoke all things into being. He spoke it into being. When we want to create something, we have to have something to start with. God doesn't. Every cell, every breath, every thought, all are sustained by him. There is nothing too difficult for him to do. He is all-powerful. And if I could get across one misnomer, and we'll talk about it. I'm, I'm thinking about doing, I hate doing this because I don't want to put any credit to Satan, but we're talking about who is God. I thought about having one message at the end of this, who is Satan, just so we understand that he is not God. He's not even close. Okay? Let me... Let me possibly give a, 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 a commercial for that. I don't even know if I'm doing it yet. That's why. Okay. We, when we, humanity now, and I say we, humanity, many times even in the Christian world, when we talk about good and evil, and we talk about God and Satan, we talk about this celestial struggle and how do we get through life, we put God up here, and for some reason, we put Satan right up alongside of him. As though it's two equal forces battling it out for humanity, like some Greek mythology. Satan, Lucifer, was created, spoke into existence by God. Satan rebelled against God while in heaven, and God just booted him out. Does that sound like equal forces? Equal power? We read in the scriptures, and everything we've read to the point of prophecy being fulfilled, the prophecy yet to come, is Satan is already defeated. Listen, the evidence of Satan, yes, is all around us. The curse of sin is in the world. But if you read in the book of Revelations, which we did a few months ago, you read in the book of Revelations, when Satan is put into that bottomless pit for a thousand years, when he's closed up, guess what? Sin still happens. Because sin is not Satan. He is the author of it, perhaps. But sin is rebellion against God. And so even though Satan has been enclosed in that thousand-year period, People still rebel against God. So when we talk about the fact that Satan has, has lost the battle, that when Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and then was resurrected, he defeated Satan on the cross. We don't have to live in this world as though I'm battling the forces of Satan, which are just as strong as the forces of God. That is a bunch of hooey. That's a technical Latin term. We won't go into it right now. God is all-powerful. Satan is a liar, 
and a deceiver, and the only way that he can begin to encroach upon our securities in Christ is to convince us that we're not secure in Christ. And so he lies to us. He threatens us. We look at, uh, well, look, look at Hollywood, who s seems to be fixated on horror movies and, and the powers of darkness. I mean, today's culture, I mean, I grew up with this a little. If I, because I watched TV as a kid growing up, it was mostly black and white. But I grew up a little, and we heard of werewolves, and that was a weird movie. We heard about vampire Dracula, and that was a weird book or movie. But it was, you know, off and on. Now it's television series about darkness and how these these heroes of the movie to the heroes of the book are defeating darkness on their own. Doesn't happen. We're not. God is all-powerful, but as a believer, a follower of Christ, we have authority in Christ over evil. God is all-powerful, and he walks, wants us to walk in that authority, but don't listen to the lie of the enemy that says, well, I'm pretty powerful too. No, he is. We can't, we can't just ignore that Satan has supernatural power. He does. But he's not more powerful than our God. And if I'm a follower of Christ, I have Christ who reigns in me. And so I lay upon Christ for the power to defeat the enemy, for the power to resist the temptation when it comes. Not that I have the ability, but Christ in me, my hope of glory. God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. And praise God for that, because then we have victory as we surrender to God. God is immutable. Probably not a word we use too much these days. In Psalm 102, verse 25, it says, O oh, of old you founded the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Even they will perish, the heavens, but you endure. And all of them will wear out like a garment. Like clothing, you will change them, and they will be changed. But you are the same. And your years will not come to an end. The children of your servants will continue, and their descendants will be established before you. In Hebrews 13, 8, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In other words, all that God is, he has always been, all that he has been and is, he will ever be. He is perfect and unchanging. Now, what does that mean for us, that God is unchanging? The only thing I could think of that maybe we could put it into, in, in, into understanding, I guess, on our, on, our, on our level, is have you ever worked in, in a company where you've had, like, two bosses? You had the big cheese, and then you had the semi-big cheese, and then you had us who were basically in the mousetrap. <laughs> you ever had that situation, and you go into work, and the big cheese says, uh, I'll use my name, Kevin, I want you to take that pallet, I want you to put it over there in that corner, and I want you to put these things on it. Okay. And then I start walking to get the stuff, and I'm moving it. In the middle of I'm moving it, the middle cheese comes by and goes, Kevin, I want, don't, what are you doing? What do you put that over there for? I don't want that over there. I want that over there. And so I want you to take that and move that over there. And so you're the little cheese. And you're going, well, I, don't, don't talk. Just do what I tell you to do. Okay. So I start moving things back over here. And then the big cheese comes back. Goes, what are you doing? I told you, I, go, I don't know what to do. You ever had that? Maybe not. Maybe I'm the only one that's filled with this frustration in life. That's, that's what it's like if God was not immutable. That all of a sudden, on a whim, he says, you know what? I changed my mind. We're not going to have salvation by grace. We're going to make it works. Or here's, here's what holiness is all about. I changed my mind. We're going to make holiness something different. We would be so lost. God was unchanging. That's why it is so, so important to maintain the truth of the Word of God, even though it is not popular today. That's why people die for their faith. And they don't recant 
you and I have been reading about this Isil, Isi, whatever, they change the name every week, it seems like. But this Islamic State, this caliphate that's trying to get started over in Iraq and Syria and so forth. And they're marching through and they're exterminating Christians. Beheading them, taking their wives and the, and the, and the young girls and, and marrying them off, even as primary girls. And they're saying, you either convert to Islam or you die. Now, if there was no substance to Christianity, it might be that you would say, sounds like a pretty good deal. I'll go Islam. But these Christians are surrendering only to Jesus. And they're being beheaded. And they're being tortured. And their families are being torn apart because they're standing for truth. And I want you to know something. God is there hard is it for us to understand that? It's because we're saying, well, he's all powerful. He could come in and just wipe out that evil. And he could. But he gave this thing to us called free will, and we are messing it up so bad in the world. But he's not going to change and say, I changed my mind. No more free will. I'm just going to come in and do it my way. And so Satan comes by and he says to us and to others in the world, if God was a God of love, he would never let this happen. If God was all-powerful, he would never let this happen. And the enemy comes in because he can't defeat God. He comes in and tries to convince us, his children, that God is not who he says he is. But God is the same yesterday and today forever. He will. There will be a day of reckoning for all the evil. We know that. It's in the scriptures. We read it in the book of Revelation. We live in an evil world because we are evil people. But God will not forget us. And he will not change simply because we're frustrated and we act so badly. God is unchanging. And here's the, the wonderful thing about that. God is holy. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 8, and the four living creatures, each of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within in the day and night, and they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, and the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, O Lord and our God, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and because of your will they existed and were created. God is holy. God's holiness is not simply a better version of the best that we know, that we know. God is utterly and supremely untainted. His holiness stands apart from anyone else's idea of holiness. It is unique and incomprehensible. It is not just the absence of sin, but the epitome of purity. When we talk about being sanctified in Christ, we're talking about being set apart from sin unto God. And one day we will have what's called the perfect, what we made the perfect life, the perf perfection of God's holiness. We're not there yet. We can experience portions of it. We can live in holiness. God even expects us to because he tells us in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, be holy for I am holy, as I am holy. And we read this and say, but that is incomprehensible. You are the epitome of purity. but he can pass to us as Christ lives in us. We can live in him and live a life of purity. Not in our own strength, but in the strength of one who is omnipotent. We fail at times 
to walk in holiness. That is the goal, to live completely in God. When we fail, we must understand the next one, that God is just. In Psalm 75, we read this, We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks, for your name is near. Men declare your wondrous works. When I select an appointed time, it is I who judge with equity. The earth and all who dwell in it melt. It is I who have firmly set its pillars, Selah. I said to the boastful, do not boast, and to the wicked, do not lift up the horn. Do not lift up your horn on high, and do not speak with insolent pride. For not from the east, nor from the west, nor from the desert comes exaltation, but God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. He does it as a result of his justice. God is righteous and holy and fair and equitable in all things. We can trust him to always do what is right because he is just. The enemy wants us to believe he's not. Why do I have cancer? Why do I have diabetes? Why do I have broken bones? Why do I have this, this thing I can't correct in my eyesight? Why? We can ask all those why questions, and I cannot answer those questions for you as a human being because I don't know the answer to them, but God can say my grace is sufficient for you. In this world, you will have many troubles. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. we are faithful followers of God, then one day we'll experience the blessing of having that perfected body and that life with him. So there is no sorrow. There are no tears. And we don't struggle with the things we do in this world. Because God is just. And it says that he will reward those who are faithful. As well as bring judgment upon those who are not. The seventh one, but by no means the last one for this morning, or the, for this morning's the last one, but by no means the last one on the list, is God is Adonai. Second Samuel 7, 18 through 20, Then David the king went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you brought me this far? And yet this was insignificant in your eyes, O Lord God. For you have spoken also of the house of your servant concerning the distant future. And this is the custom of man, O Lord God. Again, what more can David say to you? For you know your servant, O Lord God. The name Adonai means master or Lord. A more complete list we'll look at it in a minute. But this master calls on God's people to acknowledge themselves. Listen close. This is because it's really hard for us human beings. You know, we we live in the land of the free, the home of the brave, and you know, freedom, yay! You know, that's we love that freedom thing. But this says that God our Adonai, our master, calls on God's people to acknowledge themselves, ourselves, as his servants. Claiming his right to reign as Lord of our lives. There's, there's, there's the catch, because we, we, we don't want anybody to tell us what to do. Now we can say it. In, obviously, in, in the church, we're all going to say, oh, yeah, God, yeah, yeah, God, whatever you want. If that was true, we'd live that way, wouldn't, wouldn't we? This is the, this is the crux of, we, we have this independent spirit. We have this free will, and there's times that we just, God, I think I know better. I, I think this is the way we ought to do this. But to call God Adonai is to call him master. Is to say, not only are you Lord, but you're Lord of my life. I surrender my rights and privileges or whatever I have, which is really odd when you consider who God is and who we are. But at least we're acknowledging ourselves as his servant. We read what David wrote. David the king went in and sat before the Lord and he said, Who am I, O master God? Doesn't that just go tilt? I mean, 
Think about our American history and the fact that we had slave owners and slavery and so forth. We had a civil war to hopefully end all that stuff, and we still got all this stuff going on in the country. But we hear, we hear the word master, we, we hear the word servant, and it's like, oh, oh, you know, it's putting people in, it's putting people in classifications. We're putting people in these categories of the rich and the poor and, and the masters and non-masters. Listen, there's only one master. There's only one. And that's God. There is only one. It's not saying, I have God in me, so I guess I get to rule over people. <laughs> no, no, I have God in me. God tells me how I should lead as a pastor, for instance. But I have no authority to rule over you, only to rule over evil. Because Christ in me, I'm going to rule over evil. So it doesn't enter into my life. And God says, I, I should love my brothers and sisters so much that if I see them walking away from God's truth and walking into evil, that I should go to them in love and say, stop, I love you too much for you to enter into that. But to lord over them, I don't have the authority. That's God. God's the only lord. Master. God is adamant. Now, this, we can go on and on. We're not going to. This is a partial list of the nature of God. Just a partial list. A more complete list can be found on the Internet. I put that in your notes. It's from 30 Days of Praying, the Names and Attributes of God, produced by the Navigators. Much of my material comes from that. If you do not have a computer, you are on good soil today because I made some of those copies and put them on the back table. But if you have a computer... Because people that don't have a computer need those more than you. <laughs> but I can make more. There's about 25, 30 copies back there. What I would like you to do is this. As an application of this, I encourage each of us to either find the site or take the paper, and for the next 30 days, one every day for the next 30 days, pray over the name. Some of those you'll, you'll come across, we've already gone through. There'll be many more there, obviously, that we haven't. 23 more, actually. Would you do that for the next month? It doesn't have to be long and drawn out, but certainly take time to, to reflect. They're very small. There's passages of Scripture to read. Please read the Scripture in order to sustain the truth of what that name is. Read the small description underneath there that explains what that name is. Pray to God. Pray his name back to him. Pray for an understanding of what, how, what that means to us and what that means to me personally, you personally, that you're praying. God, what does it mean to me that you are in need of this? And listen to what God has to say. If you want to read more about the holiness of God and who God is, one of those resources they use is one of the Christian Missionary Alliance pastors of old, A.W. Tozer, who wrote the book, The Knowledge of the Holy, which is in our church library, by the way. This, this, is, uh, this, this is what you're looking for in that back table if you want to do this practice for the next 30 days. Um, to commune with God, to pray back his name, to seek to know and understand him more deeply. That's what I want to leave with. One of the things God does that for, does for us is the communion table. Remember, we've gone through this before. I'm going to go briefly again and give you instructions. But one of the things he says is when you come together to be at the table, examine yourself. Seek God. So that if there's something in your life where you have disobeyed God in one level or another either disobeyed him in doing something he's told you to do or disobey him in doing something you're not supposed to do, that if you know that's there, then ask God to forgive you. God is forgiving. Remember, he, 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 he examines the intent of the heart. Just to say flippantly, well, I'm sorry, I, I messed up. The intent, obviously, there is that you're not really sorry. You and I both know what that's like when someone comes up and says to you, oh, I'm sorry, but what well, doesn't mean I'm sorry. You're sorry. And that's the intent of the heart, isn't it? That sometimes we want to get something out of it, and so we go through the, through the words. And God doesn't want us to go.
skillfully work. He wants us a sincerity of heart that we understand that we offend him, we sin against him, we crush it, really, because he knows what we're capable of with Christ in us, and it hurts him. Amen. Love his Father. So scripture is given to us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, and he will forgive us of our sins. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So we can trust in that, know that that's true, but the intent needs to be that we truly are sorrowful for what we've done. That's done by, a, by the, the honesty of our heart. It's also done by the fact that we don't go back and you know, just go back and do it all over again. We just keep the pattern going, that we seek God to help to break that if it's something going on in our life. So first of all, we want to examine ourselves. Secondly, we want to be reminded, and that's what I meant about the connection here. We look at the names of God and who God is. And God wants to remind us of who he is. And so he created this thing called the Lord's Table, that's taken after the fact that Christ died for us. He wants to remind us that God loves us. He wants to remind us that that while we were still sinners, Christ was willing to die for us. He wants to remind us that the payment for the penalty of sin that we deserve, he took upon himself. He wants to remind us that that's why it's so important and imperative that we walk in God so we can demonstrate the goodness of God and the holiness and the salvation of God so others too might enjoy salvation and walking in salvation. So this morning I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward. We're going to, we're going to do it this way this morning where we're going to just ask you to get up from your seat. If you cannot get up from your seat and you need someone to help you, just talk to someone next to you or raise your hand. Our elders will be up front. I'm going to ask them to be up here. After we're done serving communion, um, we will sing a song and also offer prayers for healing. And so if you want a prayer then please come up and sit in the front. Now, I know when I give these instructions, the people that are praying hesitate. Don't, if you're going to be a prayer warrior, don't hesitate. Just come up here, sit down, and wait for people to show up. If they don't show up, great. You've still been praying. If they do show up, you got someone to pray over, okay? So elders and deaconesses and anybody else that feels prompted to pray for people, you are welcome to come up here and pray over those that come forward. And I'd ask you to do that after we have taken so we're going to pray and invite you to come forward when we start singing the music and take a uh, cracker that represents the body of Christ Jesus who was bruised for our iniquities and through whose stripes we can be healed. And then also the cup. Take both elements with you at the same time. The cup represents the, body, the blood of Christ that was shed for our sins. Take it back and sit down. And as we're singing, you can either do this alone, or you can do this with those next to you as a group, you can do it with family. But when you're ready, then eat the bread and drink the cup together. Upon when you decide, not when I do for you this morning, okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you so much for these elements that give us the reminder of your goodness. God, you are omniscient. You're all knowing. You know our hearts right now. You are omnipotent. You are all-powerful. And that you can forgive us of any sin that we may have brought in here this morning. And you will, if we ask. You are omnipotent. All-powerful and omnipresent. Odd, really hard for us to understand that, God, but you are intimately in every one of us right now. Thank you for being unchanging. Pray, God, this morning that we do surrender to you as master. That we consciously say, I am your servant. Give me directions, I will serve. Give me a mission, and I will accomplish that mission for the glory of God. Father, I pray if there's anyone here today that needs to examine themselves further. Deal to that person that needs to be refreshed in a prayer of forgiveness that needs to be confessed. Pray for those that desire, Lord, to be healed today, that as they come forward, that God, we will exercise our faith knowing that the outcome is, belongs to you, but 
we're going to believe in that which hasn't happened yet. Trust in you, Lord, for how you want to answer that prayer. Be blessed now as we worship you at the table of the Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask that you would stand with us as we begin to sing this song together. And as we sing, you are invited to come to the table and take the Lord's elements with you.
remember those words that you gave us in Isaiah and I repeat it again in the book of Matthew that Lord that your body was bruised for our iniquities and through your stripes we can pray for healing we can expect healing we can see healing through the power of Jesus Christ so God I pray that as people come as they have prayed over them that God in your mercy will give them healing and we pray against the sickness final song, if you want to stand with us, and if you would like to come forward for prayer, please do so as there are people here prepared to pray for you. I just pray in the name of Jesus, bring them peace, bring them healing. Let us experience, Lord, our omnipotent God, our omniscient God, our immutable God, our holy God, omnipresent God, our Adonai, our God of justice. God Almighty, God Almighty, let us walk this week I pray that we take the challenge for this 30 days of praying the name of God. Change us, O oh God, as we seek you in a deeper level than we have to this point. I pray in the mighty name and in Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you for coming. Go in God's peace. Please go quietly as others are praying.